Kia ora team and welcome to our second video on Achievement Standard 91328 where we are looking uh, at biomechanics but more specifically in this video we're going to take a look at inertia and formation. Learning outcome for today is to be able to describe what inertia and formation are in relation to biomechanics. So what is biomechanics? Biomechanics is a study of internal and external forces. It's how these forces act on the human body and the effects that these forces produce. Biomechanics covers a wide range of topics relating to internal and external forces. We're going to take a look at um, all of these factors throughout this unit. Things like levers, centre of gravity, force formation, performance appraisal, projectile motion, inertia, stability and balance, forces, base of support and momentum. Okay, inertia, what is it? Picture on the left there is um, a painting of a guy called Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, now he developed three laws of motion. Now his first law is called the law of um, inertia. And this law states that an object at rest stays at rest and an object at motion, um, in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Inertia can be defined as the resistance that an object has to a, to a change in its state of motion. Now for thousands of years it was thought that the natural tendency of objects um, were to assume a resting position and that the reason an object came to a resting position was because there was a lack of force acting upon it. So Newton's law of inertia really changed this way of thinking but we'll touch on that on the next slide. Before Sir Isaac Newton, there was a guy named Galileo, and he was essentially the greatest scientist in the 17th century. And he, um, he developed the concept of inertia. Now, he reasoned that moving objects eventually stop because of a force called friction. So looking at that image on the left, Galileo experimented using a pair of inclined planes facing each other. He observed that a ball would roll down one plane and up the opposite plane to approximately the same height. Now, if Galileo used smoother planes, the ball would roll up the opposite plane even closer to the original height. He reasoned that any difference between initial and final heights was due to the presence of friction. He felt that if uh, friction could be eliminated entirely, then the ball would reach exactly the same height. Or as you can see in the picture on the far right, if the ball couldn't reach the original height, it would just continue forever. Isaac Newton really built on Galileo's thoughts about motion. Now, remember the old way of thinking that force was needed to keep an object in motion. Newton's law of inertia states that a force is not needed to keep an object in motion. If I slid my cell phone across a table, it would eventually slide into a resting position. We know that. But why does it stop? Is it because there is no longer a force acting upon it? Well, no. The cell phone uh, in motion on the tabletop doesn't come to a resting position because of the absence of force. Rather, it is the presence of a force that brings the book to a resting position. That force is friction. Factors that affect inertia, the more mass that an object has, the greater its inertia and the more reluctant it is to change. Take a look at the following uh, video example. So John Lomu in his prime weighed 120 kilograms and was rumoured to have run the 100 metres in 10.89 seconds. Because of his mass, he had far greater inertia than what was standing before him. Mike Cat tipped the scales at 86 kilograms. In the video, he was standing still while Jonah came screaming at him with the full force of a 120 kilogram frame. Mr. Cat didn't stand a chance because Jonah Lomu had greater inertia, which meant his body was more reluctant to change its state of motion. Before we move on to the next section, we need to understand what a force is. So a force is a push or a pull upon an object resulting from the object's interaction with another object. In biomechanics, we look at both internal, which are forces created by the muscle within the body, and 
external forces, which are forces outside of the body such as gravity, air resistance and forces provided by other objects. Force summation adds together the forces produced by each body segment which allows maximum force to be produced by the muscles and transferred into the movements of a physical activity. The more body parts that are involved in completing a movement, the greater the force that is possible to, to be generated and transferred to a skill or a movement. Force summation is affected by three sub-factors which we're going to take a look at. Range of motion, order of body segments and timing of body segments. Okay, range of motion. This is the first factor affecting force summation. Now a synovial joint has a certain range of motion through which it can move. You can see an example of uh, the ball and socket joint of the hip there in that image. Through a joint's range of motion, the muscles associated with that joint produce internal forces. The greater the range of motion, the greater the force that can be generated. So when we look at um, that hip extension there, if an athlete could only get hip extension to say 20 degrees, um, he's not going to generate as much force. Alright, order of body segments. When forces are transferred between joints and body segments, they need to be transferred in a logical order or sequence. For effective force summation, we need to use our large muscles to generate force that is transferred in sequence through progressively smaller and more distal, which means further away, muscles in the body. So the picture on the right indicates the order of body segments in the upper body during a netball shot. Forces are generated from larger muscles, which you can see there um, beginning at the trunk, and are transferred pro uh, progressively to smaller body segments, which finish at the hand. So this gives us the most potential for the development of force. Timing of body segments. Not only do we need to use body segments in the correct order, we also need to have correct timing. This allows for maximum transfer of force. For this to happen, each body segment should be used when the one before it reaches its peak force. This coordination maximizes force production. Now when Michael Jordan in that picture dunked from the free, th free throw line, he needed the best possible timing of body segments to ensure he got every ounce of force from his muscles. This image highlights how the timing of body segments affect the shot put throw. On the left, the forces are transferred before peak force has been reached. This is too early and minimizes the overall force that can be generated, which you see there on the y-axis. On the right, you can see the complete opposite. Forces are transferred after peak force has been reached. This is too late and again minimizes the overall force that can be generated. The middle part of the, um, of the chart there shows well-timed body segments being transferred at their peak force. The overall force generated is much higher than the other two, again indicated on that y-axis. It's important to note that it doesn't have to be as uniform as drawn on this image. Segments can can be well timed while others can be later or, or early or within the same movement. This is usually what happens when you see a really uncoordinated person try to do a complex gross uh, motor skill such as jumping or throwing. So basically that's it for today. Appreciate you taking the time to watch the video. Please complete your whisk sheet before our next theory session and make sure you come up with a good uh, question to present to your group and then the class. Cheers.